Dmitri Shostakovich's String Quartet No. 8 is certainly the most popular out of the 15 string quartets he composed. And while each one of them is a unique masterpiece, and many of them would deserve more attention than they currently get, this one really stands out. I've played this quartet myself many times, and I was always fascinated with the intense effect it can have on audiences. I never forget the first time we performed it, and this great silence that seemed to last forever after we had finished playing. This is music that really speaks to its listeners with incredible immediacy. It's music that leaves some people in pain, others in shock, and many in tears. In this video I want to try and shed some light on what makes this quartet so uniquely touching. I want to find out who's speaking here and what is he trying to tell us. Shostakovich wrote this quartet in just three days, from the 12th to the 14th of July in 1960. At the time, he was staying in the city of Dresden in East Germany to compose music for a film about the Dresden bombing. Dresden had of course been largely reduced to ruins in a British and US bombing attack in 1945, and 15 years later, large parts of the city had yet to be rebuilt. This might have reminded Shostakovich of his own wartime experiences. As you may know, Shostakovich was in the city of Leningrad while it was under siege by the Wehrmacht. Knowing all of this, it would be easy to assume that the Eighth Quartet speaks primarily of war and the terrors that go along with it. That interpretation would only seem to be strengthened by the fact that the piece is dedicated to the victims of war and fascism. However, when you are trying to understand Shostakovich and the meaning behind his music, you often have to look beyond the obvious and official intent. He was a master of disguises and ambiguity, a skill that artists in repressive regimes are often forced to develop. So while the interpretation of this quartet as some kind of requiem for the victims of World War II and the Holocaust is by no means entirely wrong, it doesn't really capture the whole meaning that this piece had to the composer. In a private letter that Shostakovich wrote to Isaac Liman, a close friend of his, he makes it very clear that there's a personal, intimate aspect to the Eighth Quartet. I was thinking that, should I die someday, it's unlikely anyone would write a work in my memory. So I decided to write one myself. On the cover could simply be written, dedicated to the memory of the composer of this quartet. To understand why he wrote that, let's have a look at what Shostakovich had gone through and the situation he was in at this point in his life. When Shostakovich became a well-known composer as a young man, he was celebrated by some as an exemplary communist artist. His luck changed with his opera Lady Macbeth of the Metzensk district. At first the opera was a success, but when Stalin himself attended a performance in 1946 and left early, Shostakovich knew he was in serious danger. And true enough, the next day a famously vicious article was published in the Pravda, the official party newspaper, denouncing the opera as muddle instead of music. In this anonymous article, which some believe may have been written by Stalin himself, Shostakovich was accused of formalism. This was understood to mean that he preferred to indulge in avant-gardist experiments, rather than writing music that was simple, enjoyable and constructive to the communist ideal of society and culture. It was a shockingly aggressive article that marked a shift in Stalin's cultural policy, and Shostakovich was to be its first victim. He had very good reason to fear imprisonment, exile or worse for himself and his family. Many of his works were forbidden and he came under increasing financial pressure. After the Pravda article, Shostakovich worked quietly but desperately to rehabilitate himself. With the triumphant success of his fifth symphony, the danger had passed and he had regained, at least for the moment, the favor of the regime. 
But even though he survived Stalin's Fury in 1946 and then once more in 1948, Shostakovich never really recovered from this traumatic experience. And you can hear it in his music. You can hear the delicate balance he had to find to survive. A style that is largely bound by traditional tonality to avoid the label of formalism, but on the other hand, highly expressive and deeply ambiguous. In 1960, when the Eighth Quartet was composed, Stalin had been dead for several years, and the situation had relaxed a little for most Soviet artists. Shostakovich, however, once more found himself in a time of intense personal crisis. He had just applied to join the Communist Party, because that was required for a post he had been offered. This was a move he had previously avoided, and both his son and his friend Lebedinsky report that this decision came with a prolonged crisis of conscience, because the composer felt he was giving up his integrity and his artistic freedom. In addition to that, he was suffering more and more from a muscular weakness that soon made it impossible for him to play the piano. For Shostakovich, who was an accomplished pianist, this was a crushing development. The pressure of working under the constant oversight of the regime was always threatening to overwhelm Shostakovich, who was already nervous and anxious by nature. To make things worse, he had just recently divorced his second wife and was still grieving for his first wife, Nina, who had died six years earlier. Once you add the bleak surroundings of post-war Dresden and the haunting memories of besieged Leningrad to all of this, you begin to get an idea of the psychological state this man must have been in. This quartet is the work of an artist in deepest despair, determined to create a memorial to himself before his death. To understand how Shostakovich approached this task, let's have a closer look at the music. The first movement of the quartet is a largo, a very slow movement in C minor. The movement begins with a somber four note motif in the cello that consists of the notes D, E flat, C and B natural. If you use the German system of notation, it spells out D S C H, an acronym for Dmitri Shostakovich. It's his own name set into music, his musical signature. And what better motif could there be to open a work that is meant as a requiem for himself? His name is engraved on this quartet as if it was his tombstone. This is not the first or the last time that Shostakovich used the DSCH motif in one of his works, but in no other work is it as prevalent as in this quartet. He doesn't just use it to begin the first movement, it keeps appearing more or less hidden almost everywhere you look. It serves as a kind of leitmotif that guides us through all five movements, perhaps reminding us that the protagonist of it all is Shostakovich himself. In the beginning, one instrument after another somberly plays the four note motif, like in a fugue, thus establishing it as the principal motif of the piece and setting the dark and elegiac tone for the movement. Throughout the Largo, there is very little movement and really no development of any kind. It's mostly structured by these long, infinitely sad and mournful melodies that just never seem to arrive anywhere. And much of the material is in some way alluding to other works, from Shostakovich and from other composers. Right in the beginning, the violins and viola quote from Shostakovich's first symphony. The first symphony, which he finished at age 19, was a great success, kickstarting his career as a composer, and now he seems to be looking back at that from afar, with this slowed down and muted rendition. And then there's this theme. Which sounds like a faint echo from Tchaikovsky's famous Sixth Symphony.
Shostakovich himself mentions this reference in the letter I quoted earlier. Like the Eighth Quartet, Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony is a pessimistic and intensely emotional work. The symphony is often seen as highly autobiographical, sometimes even as a sort of musical suicide note. While that interpretation is disputed today, Shostakovich may well have understood the work that way, and it's no coincidence that he alludes to it in his own musical epitaph. What follows then is surely one of the most intense and gripping moments in all of Shostakovich's music. <laughs> The second movement erupts with this explosion of dissonance and rhythm. This moment of shock is so effective because the first movement was just long enough for us to get used to the lack of movement and the melancholic apathy of the music. So when we are violently taken out of that, the extreme contrast in tempo and dynamics is all the more disturbing. One of the first things you'll probably notice when you listen to the second movement is how the DSCH motif is everywhere, both in obvious and more hidden variants. The other thing you'll notice is the compact structure of the movement, which is only about three minutes long. The music builds into more and more of a frenzy, and it culminates here. <laughs> is directly taken from the second piano trio. The second piano trio was dedicated to Shostakovich's dear friend Ivan Zolotinsky, who died in 1944. The fact that Shostakovich references his loss once more links the quartet to his own biography and reinforces the themes of death and mourning. After we have heard both the build-up and the climax twice, the movement ends as abruptly as it has begun, and the third movement follows Attacker, or immediately. The third movement, Allegretto, is a waltz. When you think of a waltz, you might think of light-hearted dancing music, a la Johann Strauss. This waltz, however, is of a different persuasion. The tone is sarcastic and bitter. It's full of harsh turns and sudden interruptions. There's another quote to point out in this movement. I'm talking about this passage, which is the same motif that is heard right at the beginning of the first cello concerto. The cynical waltz is suddenly interrupted by a cello melody in a very high register, accompanied by chromatic scales and the violins that create this ethereal, otherworldly atmosphere. After this brief interlude, the beginning of the movement returns, except this time the quartet plays consordino, meaning they play with a mute on their instruments. The mute creates one of the most chilling, unnerving effects in the quartet. The sardonic dance suddenly has an eerie, ghostly quality to it. The fourth movement begins with another shock effect. These three fortissimo notes have often been speculated to evoke the sound of KGB agents knocking on Shostakovich's door. The sound, in other words, that a composer feared more than anything else. The movement is mostly elegiac and largely played piano, but this jarring motif returns time and again. This lends the music incredible tension, because subconsciously we sense that the violent fortissimo could interrupt at any moment. This is what it must feel like to live under the constant threat of an overwhelming force that could interrupt or end your life at any point, and for no good reason. It's an incredibly effective metaphor for the terror Shostakovich and so many others had lived through under Stalin. 
At this point, you won't be surprised to hear that there's more references and quotations in this movement. They both deal with themes of captivity and impending doom. At first, there's this duet between the violins. This is actually a melody from a Russian revolutionary song called Tormented by Grievous Captivity. It's a song about a political prisoner on his way to his own execution. Then there's this heartbreakingly beautiful cello solo. This is a reference to a scene from Shostakovich's own opera Lady Macbeth of the Metzensk district, the very same piece that had earned him Stalin's fury. In this scene, the protagonist, Katerina, visits her lover, Sergei, who, as a convicted murderer, is on his way to a labor camp in Siberia. It's another reflection on the themes of captivity and grief, and also another autobiographical reference that points to the difficulties the composer had working under Stalin. The last movement recalls the first movement. It's an expanded and more openly emotional version of the fugue-like texture with which the quartet began. This device gives the quartet a great unity of form, strengthened by the fact that each movement begins attacker. This circular structure seems to me to be a gesture of deepest hopelessness. After all the struggles on our journey, we have simply arrived back where we started. It was all for nothing in the end. The last movement has nothing else to state than that simple truth. It was all for nothing. It's a long lamento, with the DSCH motif being mournfully repeated time after time. And then, finally, the music slowly dies away. Shostakovich seems to disappear into a void of hopelessness and despair. And in the end, nothing remains but silence. So, are we any closer now to understanding what makes this music so universally touching? We've seen the many fears that tortured Shostakovich, and we've seen how he tells us about these fears in hidden clues and quotes in his music. But does that really explain what makes this music so touching to us living today? Because I've never lived under a dictator, I've never lived in a war zone, and I've never lost a wife. None of these experiences I share, and still, this music has moved me to tears. I really think there's something miraculous in that. The memorial that Shostakovich erected to himself still stands tall today. His music speaks to all of us because it speaks to that astounding capability that makes us all human, the power of compassion. Our ability to understand somebody else's pain as if it were our own, is what makes this music work. Shostakovich was able to transform his suffering into art only because he trusted that someone someday would hear this music and would understand 